Hello everyone! I'm so happy to be here. So, obviously I worked hard to assemble a panel of uh, rock stars to share as much knowledge we can on content and search arbitrage. Uh, I can say that I'm probably the less impressive person in the panel. The first one will be someone I know over a decade. He used to really rule out uh, gaming, everything that about apps and content became the native king leading out rain and now specialized in video with UGFI. Please welcome Haran. <laughs> Star number two we have. If you don't know him, it's, you probably never Google anything about affiliate marketing. He actually have one amazing blog. He's one of the most known in the industry. Attila. And last, but not least, he just won an award for the best affiliate of the year. He's a new star. You want to hear what you have to say. He's a full stack affiliate. Please welcome Arnu. So basically, we're here to speak about content and search arbitrage. And I will try to explain the difference because it seems that a lot of people are confused between the two. So search arbitrage basically is a model where you do display to search, meaning you lead traffic from display traffic. It might be social, it might be native, or it might be TikTok, to search pages. So for example, I will put an ad of dental implants. Everyone knows this vertical if you do it. Wow. On native ad, I will lead it to a content page or a search result page that eventually I click on it will be like someone actually search for dental implants. And then clicking on the ads on the search result will cause you earn money. Content arbitrage is a bit different. Content arbitrage is what we do at Chines, which is basically creating viral content that, again, we lead users from social and native to our articles. Once a user see an article, for example, you know, funny pictures from around the globe, you click on it, we pay, I will give you an example on Facebook, we pay Facebook five cents for the click. He is landing on our website and now the session starts. Basically, he's reading a lot of pages, something like 15 or 20 in average, and we still sell ads on CPM. So we don't have an offer or we don't need them to leave any information. Just by showing the ads, we will make money and then we can normalize it to EPC. So I buy in five cents, I make 10 cents, I got five cents profit. In high scale, it's becoming very interesting. Yeah? We agree? Yeah. Did you get it? Cool. So we're going to start with some questions. Uh, the idea is an open discussion that we will share as much knowledge as, we, as possible for, again, beginner and advanced. Uh, Arnur, yeah. can you describe one emerging trend in arbitrage that you believe will pivot in 2024? Sure. Uh, so one of the things that I'm looking in search arbitrage is that people are moving from AFDs to RSOC, right? Because there has been a lot of clawbacks recently, right? And uh, Google has got quite strict, right? So and also the traffic sources are way more welcoming towards RSOC. Uh, they're asking us to use content pages, right? So I see one of the things that people are moving from AFDs to RSOC. This is something that will be a huge in moving forward in search arbitrage. Apart from that, I see a lot of uses, a lot of use of AI for content creation and also for automation and also for research purpose. For example, uh, for content creation, uh, you could use tools like PixArt, Sora for you know, creating images, videos, right? And also um, for uh, keyword research and all those things, right? For example, the biggest thing about search arbitrage is that you, you, would, not wanna, you would wanna have the best converting keywords in the search page, right? So, so the way you could use AI in that is that you could just ask ChatGPT which are the best RPC keywords, which are the best CTR keywords, right? And you could, it would give you the long tail keywords that are converting best, right? So you could use a lot of AI in search arbitrage. Don't waste time in manually searching things. Take use of AI, right? So this is something, this is something I'm seeing a lot in search arbitrage. It will be usage, usage of AI in search arbitrage. Also using AI for automation and other purposes is something I see a lot in AI in search arbitrage. And Arnur, in terms of verticals, any, anything that you think will pivotal into different verticals? I know health is really big those days. Anything else that you're trying? 
Yeah, um, so there are certain evergreen verticals that I always work with like finance, finance, personal loans, credit card, this is something that works all the time, 12 months, right? And apart from that, there are certain seasonal verticals, right? Um, that works a couple of months and probably just dies. So I have seasonal verticals and evergreen verticals. So 50% is seasonal, 50% is evergreen. Evergreen works all the time, seasonal, I have to research and probably spend time in, you know, doing it. Solid, so, Aran, can you, Maybe share one strategy that worked for you for search arbitrage that is a must or content yeah. arbitrage? Uh, I believe for search arbitrage, but it also go for content arbitrage. If you want to scale, and it doesn't matter if you're doing TikTok or native or Facebook or whatever you're buying, you can just run one, two, three, four, five campaigns and have amazing revenue. The way to do it by scaling is do it horizontally. You need 20 campaigns per keyword that you're doing, even with the same creative, you need a lot of accounts, even if it's the same keyword, same creative, run 30 campaigns for each one of them. Each one would spend, let's say, $100. Uh, then you would have 3,000 instead of six campaigns doing free. So duplicate your campaigns as much as you can. Try and break them down when it's possible you know, to specific creatives once you understand what's working. But you have to be able to run dozens and dozens of campaigns and monitor them and monitor through that. All right. It de definitely makes sense. I think it's relevant to a lot of vertical. But then, you know what, Attila, how do you balance the, the cost effective from creating creative to testing or? OK, so um, creative is key. Like uh, when you guys are doing search arbitrage, you need a lot of creatives because it's going to make or break your campaign. I would say that creative is 80% of the equation. And you think uh, it's the same for content as well? Yeah, it's like it's all about creative and testing. You have to basically spend five to ten dollars max to know if the creative is good or not. Like if you think that you know you have an amazing creative and you continue to pump money into it, it's not gonna magically change and become profitable. So our strategy has always been to test quick, you know, and kill it quick as well if it's losing money. And can you tell me some numbers? So in case you are, for example, testing a new keyword or a new vertical, how many unique creative you will use, how many duplication of this creative you will use, or how you will structure the campaign? Okay, so uh, in search arbitrage, there is many different uh, niches and keywords and verticals. Some verticals, which are broad interest, they support way more uh, spend. Whereas a micro niche is not gonna have that many buyers on Google search. So our strategy is, if we're testing something like finance, which we know works good and there's a huge demand, like a lot of banks and loan companies want to give um, ad spend, they wanna buy those keywords, then we're gonna test as many as 50 different ads at uh, five to ten dollars each depending on the country and kill them quickly like if they're not profitable after the initial spend then we kill it and we continue until we and find you the will best mostly we'll test it on us or europe okay, or in, in the united states i find that because like 1000 impressions cpm is basically around 22 to 25 dollars yep. we have to spend at least 20 bucks on a creative but if you're doing something like latin america then even two, three dollars is enough because there the CPM is cheap. So again, it depends on uh, the country that you're testing and on how much your budget is. Also, if I could uh, add to his point. Uh, sure. So one of the ways you could save money in testing creatives is that in search arbitrage, if something is working in USA, you could test it in UK, Australia, Canada, and there's quite high, high likelihood that if a video is good, it will also work in other English speaking countries, right? So you don't have to spend money in you know, uh, creating the videos again. So it saves money, right? so that you don't have to waste money in crea creation of the videos again. Also, su suppose if something's working in Germany, you could try in Austria, Switzerland, all German-speaking countries, right? So this helps you to save money on content creation. And I would say don't spend more than $20 in content creation because search arbitrage is a numbers game, right? So if you're launching 10 campaigns, probably two will work, eight will not work. So you would wanna make sure that the money you're spending in launching of those 10 campaigns should be minimized. So spend as little money as possible in content creation. Solid. I, I want to add to that as well and to connect to Attila's point as well. Because when you're running search arbitrage, you're doing it on very low margins and your CPA is not like neutral. You're not going to get $130 for a keyword. You're going to get $3 in a good case. So as he said, if you have high CTR and good creative, within $10, $15, you're going to know if that campaign or that specific ad is something that you want to scale or you're going to cut it down for you know, never using it again.
Also, one of the things that you could do is that uh, just hire a video editor, right? For example, one of the mistakes I did in my early days was I had a, I had a freelancer editor and I would pay him $10 per video, right? So I would save, save way more cost by having a full-time editor and also if you could hire models and probably give them contracts so that every month they can give you many UGC videos, right? So you could save money instead of having freelancers do it for you, right? Solid. I, I want to amplify here that you need to understand that in the end of the day on search arbitrage there is an advertiser. Maybe you can think about it like a smart link of offers, maybe lead offers, that is on the back end on the search result. So this is how I like to look at it. And basically there is an advertiser with a certain budget, with a certain bid, it, he can pay on a certain keyword. So these keywords can change between countries, even cities, if it's local, uh, local companies or local businesses, and you have a certain limit on how much they can pay and how much you can scale. And then if we, we talk about it, so we talk about testing a lot of creative and testing a lot of creative and in order to lower the cost around, do you think using spy tools is smart or? I think using spy tools is amazing if you use it in the correct way. I think a lot of people are doing the same mistake that they're looking at spy tools and seeing an amazing ad that Attila created and what they're doing is copy pasting it. What you're gonna end up is lowering his CTR, your CTR, the RPC you're getting it's actually going to go lower. If you copy the ad from the spy tool, you're basically opening your map, you're seeing a traffic jam through Google Maps, and you're going where everyone else is going, and you're not going to be able to make money. The smart way to use it is opening, finding the vertical that's working, and trying maybe using AI or using a creative agency to work on new ads and find a way to scale that vertical to places maybe a theater missed out. You can use it to find opportunities, but you need to use it smartly. Yeah, I think we used to call it for years rip and run. It used to work really well for a lot of vertical. I don't think, I personally don't think it's sustainable anymore just to copy as is uh, if you want to play a, a long-term game. And then, yeah, I wanted to... So spy tools, maybe it's, we can call it a mistake. What are the biggest mistakes, Attila, that you think uh, you, you should avoid from testing. Okay, so I want to add to the spy tools thing. Like a lot of the people here think that, oh, they're never going to catch me. What's been happening in the last six months is a lot of people that are ripping ads which are not compliant, they don't necessarily know they're not compliant, are not being paid by their feeds for search arbitrage. There has been, in the past month or two, some big people that were not paid more than half a million dollars. So imagine you're running traffic, you have to float the money for 45 days, and then they say, sorry, you're not getting paid because you ran all of these uncompliant ads. Search arbitrage now cannot be outsmarted by the smart affiliate because there's people that are always looking at the ads and they're checking, are you following the policy? If not, you're going on a blacklist, you will be born, but if you don't comply, they're just gonna say, okay, you know what? You don't comply, you refuse to work with us, we're not gonna pay you, goodbye, that's it. So you really have to be compliant and do not make the mistake of not being compliant. You know, some people will laugh and be like, yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, don't be compliant, you'll not get paid. That's what the search feeds are doing now, so that's it. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's even more than that. A lot of people see it as something, you know, they see a number on the spy tool and that's it. They believe it 100%. I can tell you of a few cases that I sat down with a client of mine that showed me the results when you look at his page, he's spending $100 million a year. That client used to spend maybe half a million dollars a year and the numbers there are not accurate. It's all assumptions. So sometimes you're going to see an ad which looks amazing. The numbers are not there. They're not, it's, it shows you the direction that where you need to go, but don't copy it and don't, don't trust it 100%. Again, I will try to amplify you more. In the end of the day, there is a, an advertiser, usually a small business, but it can be a big business, depend on the niche, that is bidding on a certain keyword that you is expect that people will search on Google or Yahoo or Bing. And then it's, the intent for this click is very high when they search it. When we try to bring display to search, the intent is going down. And if we use misleading ads, the quality of the leads will go down, CPM will go down, and Google, Yahoo, or any search feed will be pissed. Um, Arnoux, do you think you should test as an, a neophilite? You think you should focus on evergreen keywords or you know, spreading and diversify uh, the testing? 
So uh, when I'm starting something, the one thing that I will do is that um, so I have you know accounts on almost all the networks. So I'll create a list of you know uh, all the four networks and probably create offer URLs and I'll start with my best videos, right? I'll start with my best three videos and I'll split test it across you know all four networks. So whichever thing is giving me the best ROI, best RPC, best conversion rate, I will scale with that. So I'll spend hundred dollars in split testing and after hundred dollars, I will um, after hundred dollars I'll find the winners and then I'll scale that. Yeah. Solid. Uh, Attila, you, you, you started to mention and we got into it to having the search feed like not too happy. I recently, I think I, I read in your blog uh, an analysis about this and specifically why you think content arbitrage is, is more sustainable. Can you share how you see things? Yeah, so affiliates being affiliates, they are always looking for the highest CTR and the lowest CPC. I mean, I'm an affiliate and I'm looking for the same thing. But I also understand for the lead buyer, basically the person that is buying uh, Google search ads, they want their money to back out, right? So if you're doing lead gen, you cannot employ the same kind of method that you do when you're running Nutra, crypto, and all the other affiliate type of offers. It's totally different. So content arbitrage, on the other hand, for example, we worked with Shines and Pub Plus for content arbitrage. Um, that is awesome because there you can actually be an affiliate who's searching for the highest CTR and lowest CPC. You can go as black hat as you want with your ad because your job is to make sure that the user spends a lot of time on the page and the more time they spend on the page, the higher your revenue becomes per visitor. And that is all about the game. So Shines, I know, is doing an amazing job creating viral style articles so you, you guys don't have to actually make the posts on your blog and stuff. They optimize it so that if somebody comes in, they will be engaged and the bounce time is gonna be minimized. So they will spend a lot of time on the page which will mean that you are gonna make way more money, so. He's explaining it better than me, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, you spoke in the beginning on AI, Arnaud. Can you yeah. talk, what do you do exactly with AI? If it's only for creative, it's for data science, for analysts, for, for analysis or for, I don't know, optimization? Yeah, uh, so AI can also be used for campaign creation, right? Uh, I'll stress, uh, so in the early days of my arbitrage, I used to spend two to three day, two to three hours a day manually launching campaigns, hundreds of campaigns, right? So you could automate the entire process of launching campaigns and, I can, and you can also automate the entire process of uh, campaign moderation and campaign pausing, right? So from the moment I launch a campaign to the moment I pause a campaign, the entire thing is automated using rules, right? So I, I use rules for it, so I use automation softwares and AI for it. Apart from that, you can use AI for content creation and most importantly, you can use AI for extracting data from Google, right? You don't have to use expensive tools like SEMrush, Ahref. You could just tell chat GPT, you know what, can you give me the best RPC keywords, the best ATR keywords, and it will give you a list of long tail keywords that are converting best, right? And also a list of long tail keywords that have good CTR, right? Let the AI do the work, right? Why would you want to spend time in manu manually doing it yourself, right? So AI is quite helpful in that way. Okay. So I actually have something to add yep. in regards to finding very good keywords. Uh, there's actually something that's $7 a month, I think. It's called Keywords and Everywhere for uh, Google Chrome. It's like an extension. Nice. So you would search like a main keyword on Google and on the sidebar it's going to like display related and high affinity keywords. And we were actually able to uh, find very, very good high EPC keywords this way. So that's nice. actually a good, I good there's thing. There's another to way to combine. use AI as well, is to actually improve your creative. I don't, I don't think that right now is able if you're using ChatGPT to replace your creators or your ability. But if you take, let's say, the top 50 headlines you have and throw it into ChatGPT and use the keywords that you found and tell them to do something in your style, you humanize ChatGPT and the results are going to be much, much higher than just telling it to write 20 headlines for a specific vertical. You know what, I want to go into AI and generating creative for video. So I just saw recently this new tool that basically generate UGC. Like completely, you, you put videos, it's creating the script, it's creating the person that speaks. It's basically fully automated UGC. As someone is, is specialized in, in UGC uh, those days, how do you see it involved? So 
I think the evolution is going to be very similar to what I just said. People are going to improve existing creatives. Uh, at UGFI, for example, we only use right now human creators, 100% organic for the users, but we do see the future going that way. If you look at the creatives out there right now, people who are using 100% AI, it doesn't look real. The language is still a bit mechanical, the, the, face, the, the face is a bit different. I think it's a way to improve it. Uh, use it for scripts, for example, or new ways of editing your video. But if you look one, two years from now, then I think about 50% of the creatives are going to be made by AI, maybe with the inspiration of a creator, but that's it. Arno, how does it divide between a video creative on TikTok to maybe static creative on Facebook? How do you divide it from your side? Uh, so mostly, one thing I've seen is that if something is working on TikTok, and if I, if I run the same thing on Facebook, same video on Facebook, it does work 90% of the cases for me. So uh, in most of the cases, I would run the same video because nice. it saves money and saves cost, right? So um, also with Facebook, I would do a lot of images because making images is quite cheap instead of making videos, right? But videos has better ROI, obviously, in comparison to images. But yeah, uh, so if, if I make a video, I'll you know, scale it across countries and I'll scale it across traffic sources. I'll save money on videos. I, I yeah. think the advantage right now by using the same videos is that on Facebook, you can be a bit more aggressive than you can be on TikTok. You can be, you it can wasn't, push it. It wasn't the opposite until like not too long ago. Yeah, but now <laughs> I think they've changed a lot. There were a lot of compliance issues on TikTok. So they kind of stopped a lot of campaigns and verticals and you have to be more compliant than what actually the feeds require. And on Facebook, you can push it. You go to financial verticals, which TikTok is not a big fan of. Uh, I think it's a great way to scale right now. Uh, but as I know said, we're seeing videos working as well on Meta as it is on TikTok. If you're using static images for search arbitrage, go to the native platforms. I think this is where you can make the most money with that type of creative. Solid. All right, we almost finished. Now this is my favorite part. I, I want to hear a success story, something that is unique to you that you found out usually, I like it, it's usually just by mistake. Uh, if you can share anything. Yeah, so there's many things I'm good at. One of the things I can do is grow plants. Uh, and we had an amazing client at our brain that had problems scaling because he was running search arbitrage for hair transplants. And every creative he tried got really low CTRs. The RPC guy was amazing, but he couldn't scale and he was trying to hire creative agencies. He was using every image you could find on any spy tool. None of it succeeded. And then I had a meeting with him. We thought about how we can disrupt the way people think. And we took pictures of all of the plants that I've killed with the leaves on the floor for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> we uploaded it. And because it was so out of the box, the CTR tripled within 24 hours and it became the biggest company ever had. I never thought about me killing plants to use it as a creative. That's it. That's it. It's a good uh, return on investment. Attila, what do you have? Okay, so uh, one of the approaches that, are, that we use in Search Arb is we continuously test new stuff because most of the guys that start Search, they all run the same stuff, right? They run jobs, education, finance, you know, it's always the same, like used SUVs, used cars, stuff like that. So we actually encourage our media buyers to test brand new stuff, new crazy ideas. And sometimes we hit stuff which is insanely high ROI and there's no competition. So by the time most affiliates realize you know, that it's something, when they start seeing a ton of these ads, we already made very high ROI. And there's nothing sweeter than high profit you know, with little work. So. Yeah. And then how do you limit the, the volume you do, you do on a new keywords, do you limit it or you just scale the hell out? Sorry? Do you limit the scale on a new keywords with a, a certain ROI in order to, to keep it running longer or? Okay, so I think you touched about dividing a winning campaign into small little campaigns Chunks. and distributing on different accounts. Exactly. For some reason, if you send everything from one account, they like cut your EPC. I don't know why they do that maybe as a safety measure or who knows. So you get around exactly how you're doing it. So that's so again, I think there is eventually an advertiser on the other side that have a certain budget and it might be a very small advertiser. I don't know, one, day, one time we ran high volume for plumbers in, in uh, Germany. So eventually who is a plumber? Is someone that have a certain budget on a certain keyword, usually have an agency or like someone with a retainer that bid on this keyword and their budget is limited. So if you're going to scale the way the hell up, they're just going to kill it. Yeah. 
Arnur, any interesting success story? Yeah. But um, the secret, Arnur, not like the yeah, one that make you the best affiliate of the year. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, um, so uh, this is something unique I did, right? Uh, so while I was doing search arbitrage, I started targeting worldwide campaigns. Like I ticked all the options of countries, right? And TikTok, uh, except for Pakistan, Iraq, and Iran. And you won't believe, um, you know, and I was running English videos in these countries, right? All the countries, worldwide campaign. And uh, thing is that when you're, when you're running worldwide campaigns, you're targeting 600 million, 700 million people in a single day, right? So you won't believe when you target all the countries at once, the CPC becomes half, literally becomes half, right? And um, my ROI was 50 to 70 percent, you know, in comparison to the usual 20, 30 percent, right? So uh, targeting worldwide campaigns, and the best thing about worldwide campaigns is that the stability of campaign is for too many days, right? In comparison to targeting only one, one country, when you're targeting worldwide campaigns, the campaign stays stable for too many days, and the ROI is way higher because the CPC decreases a lot. And you guys could use the English videos in it, right? So, and the English videos converts like crazy. But you have to make sure that the video is a little bit clickbaity, so and obviously related to context. Uh, so you could get way better ROI. Uh, this is one more story I would like to share is, um, you know, just recently, um, not recently, like two three months ago, and I've been doing it since two three months. I've been targeting those high RPC keywords in USA. Um, for example, you know, addiction counseling, addiction degrees, mental health degrees. Right? And these keywords have like $2, $3 payout, right? So one of the things you could do with this keyword is that, and you're targeting this in USA, right? Which has 200 million people using Facebook and TikTok every single day, right? So once you find something that has high RPC, like $2, $3, you could scale it like crazy, right? Even if your conversion rate is low, because these are boring topics, right? Addiction, counseling, you know, uh, medical degrees and all those things. It doesn't matter. Even if you have 10% conversion rate, 20% conversion rate, it doesn't matter, right? Because the RPC is so high, you could just scale it, right? And my ROI is 100% in this high RPC campaigns, right? So this is something I've been doing recently with TikTok uh, in USA, just targeting high RPC campaigns and just scaling it like crazy. Uh, and I'm getting 100% ROI with this, right? These are boring topics, but you know, these are something that pays a huge amount of money. So yeah. I know what I'm going to launch when I'm coming down from the stage. Yeah. Um, Attila, anything you want to share to, to the world? I think search ARB is low ROI, but it's stable. So if you approach it like a business, long-term mentality that you understand that you know the lead has to back out, the click has to back out, then it's a very good business. You can put a team on it and you can have it make money every single month for you. And if you don't want to do that, you want high bursts of huge profits, then blow stuff up on content are because there you can go crazy you know and ride all the new trends like for example if there's something new happening in the news it's gonna be an amazing angle to run on Facebook because it's gonna explode and when the trend or the news is done that is gonna die so you can really make a lot if you're the first one to jump on yeah, don't present it as easy as that you're gonna send all the BH affiliate to our to our side uh, but yeah solid so to wrap it up, we have two types of arbitrage that go going on now in affiliate uh, marketing. One is content arbitrage, which is basically sending this paid traffic, mostly native and social, uh, into website. Funny articles like, why does your cat follow you to the bathroom? Or 30 hacks for the kitchen you didn't know that I know you clicked on, for sure. Um, and then we monetize it by selling traffic, CPM based, to different SSP, DSP. Uh, Another model that we mentioned and talk mostly is search arbitrage that again is in order to kind of increase the number of searches on a certain keyword, the search, the search provider open this model of display to search. And if you do it compliant, the, the intention of the user is high enough to give you high RPC. If you're going to make misleading creative or you're going to promise free dental implants or free loan or whatever, obviously the advertiser will lower the bid. Like every business, if you want to approach it, as a long term, you need to buy sustainability and not just use Spytool to, to rip and run because it will die pretty fast uh, and it will ruin for everyone. So I think we're good. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you.